Good morning, everyone. Uh, so um, this talk is DevOps, leveling up your team. Um, I'll mention right up front that uh, it's a beginner talk, as I tagged it. So this is sort of um, not a nitty-gritty, seeing a bunch of code kind of talk. Um, I did one of those in Austin for the DevOps track with a live demo, which didn't go so well. Um, so I decided not to repeat my past mistakes and maybe give kind of a higher level talk. Um, one that I don't see a lot of um, in the different Drupal events that I go to, I think a lot of the people that are presenting on DevOps are really excited about talking about um, the specifics of Vagrant and logging and monitoring and all of the stuff that we love, um, but they don't always make a great case for why Drupal shops should be investing in doing that kind of work. Um, and that's sort of what this talk is about. It's about um, why I think it's worth making the investment in DevOps and how uh, sort of the culture and the values are important things to implement even if you don't implement all of the tools that everybody spends so much time talking about. Although, if you buy into the philosophy, um, you know, you're, you're probably going to start implementing those tools as well, right? It's, it's kind of a package deal. So I'm going to be talking about the tools that we use um, throughout, but also kind of about how uh, the company that I work at um, uses those. So hi, everybody. I'm Howard. Uh, you probably know me as Tizzo on the internet. Uh, this is Powdered Toast Man. Um, I work at a company called ZivTech. We do mostly Drupal consulting, but we've kind of expanded and are doing some other open source stuff as well, um, developing custom infrastructures and building uh, apps and other technologies as well. Um, and so uh, I've been there for about five years. I'm the VP of engineering there, so I spend a lot of my time sort of picking technical direction and trying to advise about how we should be doing things and auditioning new technologies, um, working on our hosting stack. We do really small scale um, hosting for some of our clients, just like um, custom stacks where it doesn't make sense to put them somewhere else. Um, I'll kind of talk about that a little bit more later on too. Um, and we've been doing sort of what I've, I'd consider kind of a DevOps workflow um, since way before that term existed, um, which is not to say I liked DevOps before it was cool. Um, but it's just to say that like, it, I think um, DevOps has become kind of this rallying cry. It's also become this buzzword, right? Where like, if you have the word DevOps appear anywhere associated with your name, you just start getting like three recruiter emails a week. Um, and the thing is that you know, a, lot of the, a lot of them really obviously don't have any idea what DevOps really is. Um, it gets used for this buzzword that just sort of means operations or just actually means doing sysadmin stuff or just means automation um, or means full stack. So I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about what I mean by this word and sort of the what I don't mean. So I think what DevOps isn't is a job description. Um, I think that's kind of antithetical to the whole idea of DevOps. I, I'm being that guy right now complaining that everybody's using the word wrong. Um, but I mean, I think in my defense, everybody's using the word wrong. Um, DevOps isn't just automation, um, and it definitely isn't a department. Um, just kind of a show of hands, who here, who here's a developer? And who here does operations work as well? It's pretty much everybody's hand went up. And who here would say that their, oper that their organization um, sort of does DevOps, works in that way? Okay, good, a good split. So hopefully I can make the case to the rest of you guys that, um, that you wanna bring more of these values into your culture. Um, DevOps is, this is gonna be hippy dippy, I, I, appear, I apologize right now. Um, it is kind of a movement of people trying to organize around um, a particular way of working and a way of thinking things. Um, it's a philosophy and, and uh, most of all, it's kind of a better way to organize and a better way to, to collaborate. Um, so the history, I think, helps to explain why I'm so picky about this phrase, and I promise I'll be off of this in just a second. Um, so historically, there are two teams, right? There are developers. Uh, and they just have one mandate, which is add features and add features quickly, right? Uh, and then there's a separate operations team 
who are responsible for keeping the system up all the time. Right? So the developers are measured by their ability to roll new stuff out, deliver business value on a regular basis. The operations team is measured by how many nines they can have in their uptime rating from last year. Right? These are naturally just opposing forces. You can't, these mandates are, are sort of fundamentally incompatible if you just have these two teams walled off from each other with their separate mandates. Right? Um, for one to win, the other one needs to lose. To, for developers to roll out new features, they need to roll out new stacks, they need to upgrade stuff. Um, that, of course, introduces instability. Operations gets woken up in the middle of the night. They don't want their pages going off, so they're resistant. Right, so that's where the idea of DevOps sort of comes from, is reorganizing things so that we can build one team, not two, and not silo, right? What's actually in the business's interest is finding the right balance between being able to roll out the new stuff that the business needs that um, the stakeholders are asking for, and you know, not having it go down an embarrassing amount of time, right? Probably we don't really need as many nines as we think we do, um, probably we don't need as strict SLAs as we sometimes ask for, right? A lot of the time when you ask a client, um, you know, sort of what's an acceptable amount of downtime, they kind of look at you like you're from outer space and they say none, <laughs> right? Um, which is just crazy for most organizations. Usually, usually we're way more paranoid than we need to be. Um, so the idea is that we want to build one team that can deliver more value by pulling together the, the seemingly opposing interests and trying to get um, sort of a shared understanding, also a shared responsibility to enable experimentation. I think this is sort of the key to all of the DevOps movement is really enabling people to experiment um, so that we can change more quickly without sacrificing the stability that everybody wants um, and thinks they absolutely need. Um, and then the other thing is it's just a lot more fun, I think, um, to sort of to sort of work in this way where, um, where it's a more collaborative environment where operations people are allowed to contribute to developing the tools that they need um, and where developers sort of are freed to be able to contribute to operations and how things run, um, right? When you take tear down the wall between these silos, um, friendship is magic. Um, right, so what kind of got me started thinking about this stuff is I was the only tech guy working at a film company. Um, and I was working on Drupal-based sites back in the day um, for sort of sharing the video and sharing the story behind how all this stuff was produced and sort of building the marketing sites and all of that stuff. Um, and I was developing features on MAMP on my local environment. And I was deploying them to IIS and CentOS and stuff managed with Plesk. Um, and things really did keep breaking for me. Um, I, I was constantly running into problems where there were minor server configuration differences between different environments, I mean, especially IIS, you know, six or seven years ago. Um, and things would just constantly be breaking on me. Um, so I decided, like, look, I need to not have any differences between production and development. So I started rolling, um, you know, VMs with with parallels, the only thing I could get to do it at the time, and just manually configuring everything. Um, and I found that to be a way better way of working because all of a sudden the, you know, it works on my machine problem dissolved for me. Um, and I stopped learning how to administer MAMP, which is not generally a useful skill. Um, and I started learning how to configure an actual server, which is really how I started to move from doing dev to doing ops stuff as well. Um, and when I came to join ZivTech, everybody at the time at ZivTech was actually still developing on MAMP locally, and they were running into these same problems. So I slowly got everybody else to start using VMs. We had like, you know, our golden image that I maintained, and whenever somebody wanted to change configuration, they had to like convince me to like leave doing client work for a while to like go work in their Apache configuration change, and then we'd need to manually roll those out to all the servers. But it was sort of the beginning of starting to work in this way where everybody, the, the, the skills that we were all developing were the ones that were relevant to um, what we actually used for real, right? Um, we'd start to tweak things like the Apache um, Max children and all these like 
tunables that aren't very accessible with sort of like out of the box stacks. Um, and even where we weren't running hosting ourselves, a lot of the time our clients would start to ask us questions like, oh, well, how will this scale? How will this affect caching? What do we need to do to configure this? And all of a sudden, instead of having one or two server people, ops people um, on the team, we started realizing that everybody on the team had opinions and had an understanding of how this stuff worked all the way down. Um, I think uh, Pantheon always likes to, to talk a lot about pushing people up to the top of the stack. That's one of Josh's um, big things. I think there's a lot, of, a lot of value and a lot of wisdom in trying to say, let's not waste people's time with solved problems. Um, let's try to push ourselves into the realm of, of um, where we're innovating. I think his argument is that that's usually at sort of the application level. That's usually with building out your Drupal site, your Drupal features. Um, I think there's a trade-off there, though, where if you go and say, look, I'm just going to use the off-the-shelf solution, I'm just going to pick Acquia or Pantheon or one of the other you know, sort of polished, packaged hosting providers, um, you, know, you have to know your own site, your own product, and whether that's the right choice for you. A lot of the time it is. Uh, and we, we push a lot of our clients to go that route. Um, but the, the thing that you're giving up, the, the price that you're paying for not having to ever worry about whether a server is up or down or whether MySQL's tuned properly, is that you're also sacrificing your ability to innovate at the stack level. Um, you can no longer make a decision to experiment with a new technology that isn't already on that hosting stack without having to solve a whole bunch more problems about um, you know, connecting over the network to some other data provider living in some other you know, part of the world. Or maybe you can get into the same data center, right? But you're still having to make a jump between um, what's installed in your hosting provider and where your MongoDB instance lives. You're giving up the ability to say, hey, I just want to install this custom PHP extension. Um, I just want to try this thing out. Um, and I think there's a lot of value to being able to, to try those things. Um, having that ability has led us to start doing um, sort of more service-oriented architectures where we're moving more pieces that are sort of logically self-contained units out into their own sort of applications so that they can be versioned and used independently. Um, we started using Silex uh, and Node.js for building sort of some of our API components. Um, still tying into Drupal front ends pretty much all the time. Um, but I think uh, if you've sort of gone the route of saying, look, we're just going to pick off-the-shelf cloud hosting, what you're also saying is we're giving up the ability to audition those other things for trying those things out easily. Uh, and with the advent of Puppet and Chef and some of the sort of mature um, recipes that you can use, um, you know, Providing Drupal hosting doesn't need to be that hard, especially for your development environments. Um, so um, luckily, DevOps has kind of given us a set of organizing principles um, to kind of rally around. So this is sort of the, the philosophy and the movement part of DevOps is uh, you're right, it's not just a bunch of people sort of saying, um, let's stop having developers and operations fight. Um, it's about saying, uh, let's, let's identify and, and hold up some of the really valuable cultural things that we've discovered um, and, and sort of talk about how we can implement them and how they can benefit us. So CAMS is sort of the, the DevOps acronym, Culture, Automation, Measurement, and Sharing. And these are kind of all overlapping complementary ideals. And I want to talk about each one and kind of how it relates to Drupal and specifically how, um, how we use it, how I use it in my Drupal practice uh, at ZipTech. So culture, culture is one of those kind of tricky ones um, where you hear the word and it kind of means everything and nothing at the same time. Um, I, uh, I'm stealing this uh, definition from a, another DevOps presentation who stole it from a book. Um, uh, so I like the definition, a set of shared mental assumptions that guide interpretation and action in an organization by defining appropriate behavior um, for various situations. Oh, typo, for various situations. Um, so it's a little bit wordy, but the idea is sort of that we have a shared understanding that enables us to look at any given situation 
and kind of all make the same judgment call there. Right? This is something you kind of develop over time with your team. You certainly can't change it suddenly. Um, so some of the some of the sort of DevOpsy cultural assumptions that I think we have at Ziftech. One is everything should be repeatable. So if you're doing something in a way that's not repeatable, we consider that a bug. And we're certainly by no means perfect with how we implement this stuff. Um, there's lots of room for improvement. Um, but it's sort of like a anyone at Ziftech, if they see something that's not repeatable, would tell you that that's something that we need to work on. Um, and we'll get to some of this. Right? I'll, this has a lot to do with automation, and I'll get to some more of that, um, that later. Another thing is developing locally. And the sort of upshot of that is that you deploy for integration. Um, it's amazing how many of these conferences that I go to where people still are arguing that they shouldn't have development environments or that they don't see the value in it. Um, I think um, Pantheon adding SFTP support so that you can just switch it into I'm just going to do stuff right on the server mode um, has kind of empowered a lot more people to continue working this way um, where it sort of was starting to become fighting upstream before that. Um, so the point with developing locally is that each member of your team, and the more members of your team there are, the more critical this becomes, has their own copy of the site locally um, so that they can make their changes locally without breaking somebody else's. Right? That's one of the benefits. If they forget a semicolon in a PHP file, it doesn't cause a catastrophic failure for everyone that's working on that dev site. Um, but the other thing is that this starts to enforce that repeatability. Because if you develop the feature locally, how do you get it into the dev environment? And if you've got a staging environment, how do you roll it from the dev environment into the staging environment, from the staging environment into the production environment? And there's a bunch of different ways to solve this, but I think it's critical to have a way. And um, I'll kind of come back to some of the ways that we do that in a minute. If it matters, it's inversion control. Um, content would be the one big exception to this. Um, we tend to keep, we tend to sort of have a blessed canonical database early on, fairly early on in our process, which is where you know, actual nodes, actual comments, actual users live. Um, but presumably all of that stuff um, is, I mean, it's not that it doesn't matter, um, but it's sort of not what we're developing. We don't have content writers on our team at this point. Um, what we're working on really is the code stuff um, and, uh, and the, the sort of client data content um, lives in a backup system. Um, but if it's a ticket assigned to a developer, it ends up in version control. Um, and if that means adding something to a node, that usually means um, it ends up in an update hook. And somebody's written some code to be able to deploy that. Um, everything gets reviewed. So at ZivTech, nobody closes their own ticket. We sort of have adopted the Drupal.org workflow of um, you mark your own ticket as um, sort of resolved or, or you know, ready to be reviewed. Um, and then someone else marks it closed and fi or fixed um, after they've had an opportunity to review the code, see it actually functional in an environment, um, and uh, demonstrate that it does what it was supposed to do. Um, another one of ours is to open source whatever you can. Um, I don't think this is strictly speaking tied into DevOps, but it sort of overlaps with some of the sharing component that we'll come back to later. Um, we try to push as much as we can out into contributed modules, contributed patches to, um, to existing modules, core, or whatever. Um, and that sort, of, that sort of ties into the communication component. And again, we'll get back into this uh, in this sharing section. But um, if someone's done some work and they haven't documented that, everybody says, right, you made the wrong call there. Um, we try to make sure that everyone's as redundant as possible, that somebody winning the lottery and leaving forever isn't going to ruin us. Maybe more likely getting hit by a bus isn't going to ruin us. Um, code review. I think it's worth mentioning this again, because um, I think this is the single biggest thing you can do to improve your team. Who here has code review as a required step in your process? Right, so maybe a quarter of the audience. Um, if you take nothing else from this talk or this DrupalCon at all, I think it would be worth attending if you can just make that one change. Um, I think there's a bunch of different benefits to doing code review. Um, part of the deal is that um, this is kind of how reviewing your own code usually goes. Um, you kind of tap at it. 
but really, it's your baby and you love it and, and you're not going to really be very rough with it. Um, your team members who are afraid of being woken up in the middle of the night with a bug report, um, they kind of wail on your code a lot harder. Um, <laughs> And so, like, that's really what you want before things hit production, right? You want someone to really wail on this thing and let you know if it's wrong. Um, um, we're, pretty, we're pretty serious about the code review step. Um, we enforce Drupal's coding standards. If, you're, if your code doesn't pass coder, it gets sent back to you. Um, if your comments don't start with a capital letter and end in a period, a lot of the time we'll, we'll pass it back. Like, our, our view is that everyone's code should look like it was written by the same person. Um, which, you know, you can, a lot of the time you can still kind of tell. But, um, but the point being, hmm? Matt? Yes, please. Um, so how, how many developers are you talking to from business to business? How many developers are in the team? Our team has around 20 developers at the moment, I think. And, uh, you but they won't, they won't all necessarily be on one project. That's right. And, uh, and this always works out. You always do it. We always review the code from the team, absolutely. So um, the key, again, part of it is getting it built into the culture. Um, and, um, and so we have it built into our sort of issue tracking system as well. I mean, it's in people's ability to mark things closed directly. Um, but, uh, but the workflow, you, again, you get in trouble for doing that. The workflow that we have is um, you work on the ticket, you mark it resolved, and you pick another member of the team to assign it to. Um, so it's not always the same person, and I think that is a critical component of code review as well. I mean, if you're on a team of two, you're on a team of two, right? But if, if there are other people, it's really important to have heterogeneous sort of code review because there are different techniques, there are different approaches, um, and sometimes what comes out in code review is not that what the person did was wrong, it's that there's a better, newer way. Um, and so by constantly passing code around, um, you end up communicating the best ways of doing things, communicating the standards uh, more fully, and you start picking up more from other members of the team. Um, it is the, I think it is the single thing that we've done at ZivTech to make the whole team better. Um, it, it's really been, I think, transformative for us, uh, and we started that fairly early on. Other questions? That's a great question. Do we, do we have a hierarchy for code review, or can people on the same level review each other's code? Um, uh, yes, it's sort, of, it's sort of a mix. So um, we don't send a code review from a senior person to a junior person, some deep, right, some senior person's writing some obscure views plugin. We don't send that to someone who mostly does site building and say, does it look good? Um, we try to find someone on the team that's, that's going to have a sort of critical eye and applicable uh, feedback. That said, having junior people review that like obscure, crazy plugin is an amazing opportunity for them to learn. So if we have the time, um, we will sometimes do sort of shadow code reviews is what we call it, where we'll grab a junior, a senior person will grab a junior developer and say, I'm about to sit down and review 10 tickets. I want you to just sit with me and you just walk them through it. Um, it's an investment, because now you're paying a junior person for an hour that you probably can't bill anyone for, um, but they learn a lot. Um, the other thing that we'll sometimes do is assign a junior developer a code review ticket and then have a senior developer just take another pass at it. Um, one of the required elements of our code review, like I mentioned before, is seeing it work. You can't just review the code and say, oh, it looks fine. You need to check out that feature branch, deploy that code, see that it's actual, actually functioning on your local environment, see that it's functioning on the dev environment, see that code somewhere. Um, and so having the junior developer sort of work through it and write up what they were able to glean and then having a senior developer still review the, the code, that could be a much more cursory review for the senior person, making sure that there's no, you know, security vulnerability, performance implications, some of those things that junior people are less capable of picking up. Um, but yeah, I think, um, I think moving it around to having 
junior people see more senior people's code and vice versa um, really gives you some of the best opportunities. So it's really about sharing things all around. Other question? How much time? How much time should you allocate to code review? I think our general number is somewhere around ten percent. I think it was a much bigger time investment at the beginning of the project, and to some degree, if you get into a huge amount of debt in code review, um, it becomes very difficult to dig out. So another important component of code review is that the feedback loop should be as tight as possible. Um, I think doing a pull request based kind of workflow like using something like GitHub or Bitbucket um, makes a lot of sense um, because it, it makes it much easier for that code to kind of be isolated from all the other things that are going on and you can still click that merge button. And there it gets even more important because if you don't merge it in soon, the code starts to diverge, right? And um, you've got people sort of chasing patches like we do so much in the Drupal community. Um, Oh, right, so um, does the person who's reviewing do the merge or do they? Well, they do the merge if it's ready, <laughs> right? At some point, hopefully, you get through review. At some point, hopefully, it doesn't just keep bouncing back forever, right? Hopefully, at some point, your feature gets finished, gets polished, the comments get fixed, the, the tabs get replaced with two spaces, the um, security problems get resolved, and you click that merge button and, and pull it in. Um, and we don't always use feature branches. For some of our smaller projects that have smaller teams, um, we'll, we'll commit right to master, especially if there aren't very many junior people where there's less stuff that you end up having to revert or roll back. Um, but it, it, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a mix. Um, but yeah, in terms of whether we're using pull requests or whether we're committing right to master. Um, but for any of the bigger stuff or scarier stuff, we use them, uh, feature branches. Um, and then, um, and then, yeah, the, the person who's doing the review is the, usually the one that, that merges that, deploys that, rolls it into the next tag, whatever, um, once it's ready. If it's not ready, it gets bumped back. It, it doesn't come in yet. Um, any other questions on that? Right, where do we, um, what does the code review cover? Is it just uh, where you put the curly brackets and whether you're using two spaces or is it the functionality? Um, it's both. So the idea, again, is that this is the review before it lands in master, before you consider it done, before you check it off as finished. So if the functionality isn't fully there, it's not ready to be committed to the degree that your specific ticket isn't finished. So uh, we, what we try to do is break things um, down into the smallest, the, 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 the indivisible piece of work. Um, so a lot of the time we won't have a ticket for build the homepage. We'll have a ticket for um, you know build the recent news items list. Um, and then that gets sort of incorporated into the homepage in that piece of the ticket. Um, so a lot of the time, your responsibility for whatever you're responsible for whatever functionality was in sort of your ticket. We try to break things down as, as far as we can because having smaller tickets that have um, that have a shorter life cycle makes it easier to keep track of the code. It makes it easier to do review, especially. It's hard to review a, a ticket that has a thousand commits in it. It's really easy to review one that has seven. Um, also, it, uh, we try to work in two-week sprints, and so if a ticket's going to take more than a day or two, um, that usually starts getting scarier in terms of estimating, scarier in terms of delivering on time, scarier in terms of um, holding up other people. Um, and so we try to sort of break that down, and then the code review does resolve um, both the coding standards issues and um, whether things are, are actually functional, and usually writing any tests is built in at that level you're responsible for writing the tests on that 
for that ticket, for that piece of functionality. Um, but again, someone needs to review the tests, right? Because the tests, it's really easy to, um, to have tests for all of your modules. You can just add a little, um, you can just add a little simple test uh, that returns true, right? It doesn't actually need to test anything to have a test, right? <laughs> um, what you really want to do is you want to keep track of your code coverage. You want to know how much of the module you're testing. Um, you want to make sure that someone else has looked at it and seen that you're testing what you actually care about and you're not testing um, things that you don't. Or, I mean, it's fine if you're testing things that you don't, but it's not if you're failing to catch things that you do. Um, Automation. Again, this is what a lot of people just sort of confuse with DevOps on whole, but I think it's a really important component, um, particularly around that repeatability stuff. Um, so I think one of the keys, and again, this is one that, that really helped us, was um, having infrastructure as code. This, again, one of the things that sort of is one of the hallmarks of the DevOps movement. Um, a lot of people think DevOps just means chef or puppet. Um, it doesn't, but you're able to do a lot more when you start looking at infrastructure as code. So as I alluded to before, we started out developing on MAMP, moved to a golden image, and then eventually moved to a golden image built from Puppet, and then a golden image built on demand from Puppet using Vagrant. So the idea is that, um, does everybody here know what Puppet is? Most of you, okay, good. So um, for the few hands that didn't go up, it's sort of a way of, um, and Chef's kind of the same, it's, it's sort of a way of describing um, as data what should be installed, what should be configured um, on the server, and then you can run Puppet. It'll compare what's there to what should be there and resolve the differences. So having infrastructure as code really allows you to start experimenting and allowing ha allows you to have more members of your team be able to say, hey, I think we should switch from memcache to Redis. Well, that's easy for a developer to say um, if it's not their problem, figuring out how you're going to deploy it, how you're going to manage the instances, how you're going to test that it actually works, how you're going to get it deployed onto everybody's local system so that they can try out Redis. Um, or more importantly, um, um, how they're going to get it into production if you're running your own production instances. Um, and having infrastructure as code really makes that easier because it's you get they set it up on their local system using Puppet. They can repeat it over and over and over again using Vagrant, which automates doing that inside of a virtual machine. Um, and then when it's ready, you can roll it out to production with the exact same code. Um, testing. So who here does automated testing on their Drupal projects? Like a tenth of the audience, maybe. Um, after code review, this is like the next biggest thing that you could pull away from this uh, whole conference, um, but definitely this talk. Um, Amitai is, is always big on saying like, just have a test. Even if that test just logs in, it's so much better than having nothing. It tests so many things. Um, it tests like that catches the stupid merge conflict that you accidentally committed and pushed to master, right? Before anybody complains because they finally hit that, um, they finally hit that dev site. Um, I think testing is one of those things that, it, that it's, it's really easy to say um, it's too hard or it's not worth it um, because you sort of assume we don't really have good testing unless we have 100% code coverage. Getting 100% code coverage on a Drupal site, I mean, good luck. Like, you're just not going to do it. It's not going to be worth it. Um, in terms of being able to execute every one of those freaking conditionals from all of the permutations of all of the configuration options from all of the checkbox that Amitai built into the organic groups administration, right, forget it. There's way too much that you can do. Um, so I'm really big on testing the stuff that you care about, the stuff that you're worried is going to break, the stuff where your client might fire you if you roll out a new release and that thing doesn't work. Um, also sort of, there's a lot of things that you can do in Drupal where you're tying together lots and lots and lots of really sophisticated pieces, right? You can take organic groups, you can um, index it into solar using search API, you can build a panel page that teases a part of view that gets rendered from the solar search results. 
uh, and lays it out, right? If any of the APIs of any of those two dozen modules involved in that process changes something, um, you can just have catastrophic failure. And so that's, that is a concrete and specific example of something that I'm always careful to test. Let's write a test that goes in, hits the search page, search, uh, page and make sure that we're actually even getting results. Um, and that has absolutely captured a lot of regressions. Um, environments. Um, who here has multiple environments? Development, staging, local? Okay, good. Just about everybody. Um, I think Acquia and Pantheon have helped a lot. When I used to talk to people at conferences, it was amazing how many um, did things cowboy style on the production server um, or just had a dev server and a production server and no one worked on local instances. Um, I think having multiple environments is really key. And we'll talk about that more in a bit. Uh, yeah, question? I'm going to come back to that. Um, Cron is another thing that every single Drupal site needs to be able to run. Oh, so I just gl uh, glossed over deployment. Um, this should be automated, absolutely. If you're on Acquia or Pantheon, you know, congratulations, it pretty much is. Um, minus the fact that an amazing number of people still have a checklist of things that they need to go in and do manually on the site when they deploy their code. Um, that might be worth it. Um, but I mean, maybe, or sorry, maybe it's not worth it to automate all of those steps. I've seen projects where it wasn't. Um, it usually is. I think if you have a, a checklist of things that you need to do, um, that's not really repeatable. And you've done something really important. Um, you made an important mistake. You've made it a point of friction to be able to deploy your code. So what you really want to be able to do is redeploy the development environment every single time somebody pushes code. You want, uh, we usually have an automated process every night that takes the production database and pulls it into the development environment and then runs the deployment step, um, which usually means reverting all the features and then running update hooks. Um, so that, sh that happens every night, which kind of gives us that continuous integration that we know that nobody broke anything in production by changing something in the database or doing something dumb that they shouldn't have done um, that's, going to, that's going to trip up something on our dev site. Um, so that just runs all the time and then we usually have a staging environment where we think things are about stable, we deploy it to staging um, and prep that and the client vets it or promises that they vetted it and don't actually look at it and then complain a lot when it goes to production. Um, but they complain less when you point out, look, it was deployed to staging three weeks ago. Eh? You said you looked at it. Um, um, yeah, so you want to be able to roll your deployments all the time. If there's friction, you'll just do it less. That's just a fact. Um, and so automating that stuff totally becomes worth it because uh, that's always the stuff that bites you when you're in a different environment. There's human error. You're under a lot of pressure. Um, that's where you'll forget a step. That's where you'll trip on something. Um, cron is an important piece of automation, and so many people just go into cron tab and set a cron job for to run, you know, drush cron, and they call it done. Um, those people do not log in and check mail on the server to see if cron's been failing, generally, right? They just wait until they get a call from the client saying, um, my search isn't working, I can't find the content that I posted, and then they find out that cron's been failing for three weeks, and was it doing anything important over those three weeks? Let's hope not. Um, uh, we, the way we manage Cron is we have Jenkins uh, run it for us. Um, I'm not sure that that's necessarily the best way to do it, but it's a pretty good way. Um, so Jenkins um, calls out to the, uh, the server that is running the Drupal site, runs Cron, and what's nice about that is it captures not just whether it was successful or failed, um, not just contacting us if it is failing, um, but it also starts to graph. It, for, it collects the standard out and standard error where the Cron ran, so that you can go in later and see if it did fail, did it throw an exception, did it time out, what happened. Um, and it also keeps track of how long cron is taking. So you can graph it over time and see, do you have some process that's gonna become a problem later? Um, you can just kind of check in once in a while in your Jenkins instance and um, see if cron's starting to take longer and longer and longer. Some modules doing something stupid and probably crawling over all of your content or something. Um, 
and at some point it'll fail. So being able to see that stuff before your clients do um, is really helpful. Obviously backups, right? If backing up isn't an automated step, you're doing it wrong, fix it. Um, again, if you're on Pantheon or Acquia, that's dead simple. You check a box in the UI. Um, if you're on your own, Jenkins, again, is a good, is a good answer. Um, so infrastructure as code, I think virtualization is extremely useful. A golden image is sort of um, less good. Again, Puppet Chef Ansible for being able to um, see the differences because then your server is in version control and you know exactly what's changing. And again, to adopt this, you don't need to start from scratch. You can take one of the existing projects. Um, I work on one called Proviso. Um, there's also the, uh, the Calibox, where they've open sourced their Cala stack of, of their configuration of their LEMP server. Um, uh, I've got ZivTech. We, we've open sourced ours, which has a lot of the same stuff that we're running on our actual servers, um, like production servers. Um, you don't need to start from scratch. You can get something totally functional right out of the box and then make it better. Um, and Docker, I think, in some ways is sort of the future um, because it allows you to have a, you know, a single test server that can, that can be testing heterogeneous software stacks. Um, I'm working on a project right now uh, to be able to have an environment stood up for each one of the pull requests for each one of the tickets um, so that you can go in and sort of see that stuff um, in the continuous integration environment, because you can spin up any number of environments, they're really cheap. You can put them to sleep when um, nobody's looking at it. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more around that. Testing. Uh, what do we use? We use Behat. That's our tooling. Behat is a project that came from Symfony. Um, there's a whole bunch of great Drupal tooling around it. This guy, Jonathan Hedstrom, and, um, and Melissa Anderson, and a bunch of other people have worked on a Drupal extension that knows how to create users and do a bunch of other things. Um, Behat is behavior-driven development. Um, I highly recommend, I think there's a couple of sessions about it here. Um, if you can catch one, I highly recommend it. Basically, you can describe, it comes from Cucumber and, um, and that set of Ruby tools. You can describe in natural language, um, or a domain-specific language that's fairly natural, given some set of conditions when a user does something, then this is what they should see. And that grammar really doesn't leave much room for ambiguity. It doesn't leave much room for writing flowery but unclear verse about how your Drupal site should work. It forces you to lay out, these are the conditions, this is the action, this is the resulting behavior. Um, I highly recommend Behat for doing Drupal testing, especially since you can sort of compose a lot of it from pre-existing steps um, and keep it readable even to the client. So our clients collaborate with us on writing the specs that become the executable tests that verify that that functionality that they care about continues to work forever. And it forces you to keep your documentation up to date because the documentation is the set of tests. Um, another thing that we've used to some success is Casper, um, sort of a framework on top of uh, Phantom JS for controlling a browser. Um, you can run these on Travis if you kind of get everything wired up right and if your tests don't take too long. I know Travis has a limit on exactly how long it takes, which is why we run around Jenkins instances and run our tests there. Um, so every time you push code, it hits Jenkins, it runs the tests, it reports back to HipChat, um, which I'll mention again in a second. If you're, you're running PHP projects, you're at DrupalCon, you probably are. Jenkins PHP is an awesome template for setting up a Jenkins project. Um, for doing code coverage so that you, again, don't get freaked out if you're testing 20% of your Drupal code. Um, that's way, 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 way better than none and probably most of what you're using. Um, but uh, so it's got pieces for doing, um, for doing that, for doing um, coding convention enforcement so you can actually graph and see whether you've got more or less coding standard violations over time. Um, if you're running this on your entire Drupal code base, you're going to have coding standards violations. I think there are still a lot even in core. Um, but you're going to know whether you're making the world a better or worse place with each commit. Um, and again, Jenkins PHP has some of the, um, just sort of the configurations and the, and the plugins, Jenkins plugins that you need to do some of the code quality um, code sniffer stuff. Again, the point of this stuff is that you just want to sort of um, be able to start rolling patches um, 
before there's a gaping hole that you're trying to cover. Um, it's really better if you can sort of uh, know how something's going to go before you roll it out. Um, it allows you to move a lot more quickly and just sort of always hit the ground running. Um, so you can just kind of have release after release after release without actually losing any momentum. Um, I know it takes a second to really get what's going on in this GIF. Um, any questions on the testing stuff? I know that's kind of a big topic that I sort of talked about at a high level. Um, environments, again, I think you should have at least three. Um, that's dev, production, and a local for everybody that's working on their site. Um, dev ends up being an integration environment because everybody's working on their local stuff and then they need to deploy it to the shared development environment. Um, for us, that usually happens in an automated way, either on Acqui or Pantheon, or we use a Jenkins job to learn, you know, see that the commit came in. Depending on how long the tests take and the nature of the site, um, either we run the tests and then deploy that commit if it worked, um, or just deploy the commit and kick off the tests to run in the background, because some of our Drupal test suites take 45 minutes, which is a problem in itself. Um, but yeah, maybe N. Having an environment for a feature branch makes a lot of sense a lot of the time, especially if you're developing some big change. You want some place, if more than one person's working on a um, working on a branch, working on moving things into a branch, I think that should have its own environment. Um, that's dead simple on Pantheon with multi-dev. If you've got that on your Pantheon account, you can just click a button and get a new environment, get, name it whatever you want. Um, but uh, it's really nice to be able to have that solved for you. Uh, automating environments. Um, I think the best way to do it probably is to push as much as you can into an installation profile so that you can install fresh and get everything there from scratch. Um, we always start our sites from an installation profile, but like I said before, we usually end up with kind of a blessed database fairly early on. Our workflow is, um, involves getting the client in to start putting into site, putting in content to the actual site as early as possible so that we can start getting feedback on the UX. So we usually start with the back end, building out the content types, building out the administrative interfaces, then we start working on the front end so that we can get those clients in there learning the system and giving us feedback on how it works for their business. Um, but I know a lot of other shops are moving more and more to installation profiles and the content comes from somewhere else. Um, synchronizing environments. Having multiple environments isn't great if you don't have them um, synchronized in an automatic way. So again, that's mostly about... Um, your hosting provider, or uh, if you want something open source, DevShop is an excellent uh, provider. It allows you to create as many instances as you want across multiple sites, multiple servers. It's um, built on top of Agar. Uh, Acqui and Pantheon have that stuff built in. You want it to be one button to synchronize an environment. Um, you can just use Drush. Drush has a subcommand called SQL Sync and another one called File Sync, which will uh, move the database or files in place. I also built a Drush extension that we use called Drush Fetcher. I'll give you a quick commercial for it. Um, basically what it allows you to do is um, define all of the different sites and all of the different environments that you have in one place. It can either be in Drush RC files that you can version control, or there's a services module so you can have a shared Drupal site where all of the different pieces go in one sort of cloud accessible um, Drupal site. And then from the command line, you can see the list of all the sites that are available, and you can say, grab me this one, grab the database from the dev environment, from the production environment, from the whatever, and set me up a local copy. Um, the key is that you want this to be as effortless as possible, especially on local. Um, if it's easy, you'll do it the right way more often. If it's not, you'll end up having, you know, oh, I can't actually test that right right now because my database is three weeks old. Right, the database, you should be able to update your database while you're getting a coffee. Um, features, um, right, it sucks, but it's still the best we've got till D8 and configuration management solves all of our problems, I hope. Um, failing that, um, there's also update hooks. Um, so there's lots of stuff that just needs to happen in the database still. Um, writing update, those hook update n functions, in my experience, is the only way that you can really roll out anything on a Drupal site. Uh, cron, I already talked about. Backups, again, you can just use what's built into Drush and Jenkins if you're not running, if you're running your own hosting. 
Um, that should happen automatically. Measurements. So, um, you know, this whole idea of CAMS is a lot about sort of bringing the scientific method, repeatability, measurements um, to Drupal development, pretending computer science is really a science. Um, oops, Montioring. Montioring is critical. Um, some of the things you might want to Montior are uh, uptime. This could be as simple as something like Pingdom, um, just hitting your site and letting us know, uh, letting you know if it's, if it's working. Um, but ideally, you also want to be monitoring, monitoring your uh, underlying services. So um, you don't want to wait and see the whole site went down. You want to, I'm really glad that uh, the chair is documenting that slide. Um, what's that? Yeah, monitoring also sucks. Uh, monitoring and monitoring, we need a hashtag for that as well. Um, so again, I think kind of like automated testing, Anything's better than nothing, and you need to ask yourself what good enough is. Um, if you're on Acquia or Pantheon, you get their status page um, and maybe Pingdom or something. Um, one of the reasons that we still offer hosting is uh, some of our clients, you know, besides the like they want to run something that Acquia or Pantheon don't support or they want it behind their firewall, um, they want better monitoring of their underlying services. They want to know how much how often Redis goes down, whether the database goes down. They want to know that immediately. Um, in terms of tooling, um, I've used Nagios, Isinga, and Sensu. Um, Sensu is my current preferred uh, answer to the monitoring solution. Um, I highly recommend you checking it out if you're setting up monitoring. Um, it takes a little bit of setup to get uh, RabbitMQ and some of its other dependencies working, but once you have it, it's dead simple to roll out little pieces of, um, of checks to add and remove servers. Um, and you can just write little bits of code instead of wading through miles of configuration um, like you used to in the Nagios world. Um, Sensu, S-E-N-S-U. It's, uh, it's written in Ruby. Um, it's short enough that you can read the, all of the code on your train ride home, probably. Uh, it's relatively small, relatively new, um, really pretty elegantly set up um, and uh, built for the cloud, where you have, you have servers sort of coming up and going down, and you want to be able to join fluidly without having to roll out miles of configuration like you do in Nagios right now. Um, another thing that's, that's sort of harder to monitor but useful if you can is rate of change, however that you want to measure that, whether that's um, number of signups per hour, number of click-throughs, um, amount of code, lines of code being rolled out at any given time. Um, some of the tools that we use, Google Analytics, um, you know, it's not great, but it does an awful lot, and if you've kind of learned your way around it, can be customized pretty well. Um, again, that's more for maybe less for your ops side. A lot of the time that ends up helping you to measure more some of your content strategy and um, other things, but, um, but it can be pretty informative um, for a lot of different things. Again, Pingdom, really dumb, just is the site up or not. Sensu, that's how you spell it. Um, really good for being able to keep an eye on, you know, is my SQL replication too far behind? Is the Redis instance up? Is... Um, sort of name your thing. Highly scalable, really nice. Um, log stash for collecting logs. We actually pipe it into gray log for the UI. Um, or you could use a service like Logly. Um, Graphite is a tool for um, graphing all of the things. Um, it has a really nice scheme for being able to just chuck metrics into it um, in kind of a namespaced way so that you can easily sort of aggregate them. Say, like, show me the number of hits per hour in this data center um, on this environment, on this server, um, and you can sort of get as granular or as broad as you want if you group them properly. Um, I've never used Libretto, but it's a, it's a hosted solution, probably a lot easier to set up. Um, yes? The Drupal module called Production Check. I haven't used that one. Production Monitor. I haven't used that one. I've used the uh, Drupal Nagios module, um, which will let you know whether things are up, let you check on whether modules are out of date, let you check on when cron was last run. Um, so um, we use that. 
Um, and you can use that with Sensu as well. Um, no, but Sensu can use Nagios plugins. So you can you can sort of get it working with the, the Nagios check. Um, uh, profiling. So uh, just some things to kind of keep an eye on for keeping track of performance. Again, measuring all of the things is important. Um, but uh, these are just a few things that we try to keep an eye on. Slow query logs. Um, you know, it's kind of a dumb check, but it is really informative. It, with Drupal, a lot of the time, that's where you end up sucking up a lot of the, uh, losing a lot of the performance. Um, maybe even more, why slow? Um, being able to tell you why your front end's being slow, which external library the client required you to add is blocking the load of your page. Um, uh, just simple benchmarking. Just even something as simple as using Apache AB um, to just hit the site and um, tell you how many pages, you know, how many loads you can run in a minute. Um, you know, don't forget to run it a few times and make sure you, you know, not accidentally measuring when things aren't cached or something, or when they only when they are. Um, and you can get you can get much go much deeper. I've done some things with the grinder or JMeter or other other tools, but um, a lot of the time AB will tell you a lot. Um, if you need to get down into it, XHProf and XDebug. Um, can be really good. XHProf, you can actually run in production uh, if you're running your own servers, and you can sort of find out how long you're spending in all the function calls. Initially, it'll seem like a bunch of gobbledygook that's not actually useful, but once you start to work with it for a while and get a feel for where Drupal spends most of its time, um, this kind of lets you, uh, lets you learn a lot about when you're making things better or worse in your application. Um, and it's important to monitor in all of those environments. Because if you're not monitoring in dev, it's kind of hard to have a good sense of whether you're making things better or worse before you roll it out to production. Um, Oh, monitoring in dev, uh, right. You might want to do some kind of stress test. Again, um, AB for uh, for really dumb tests, or you could use something more involved like the, the grinder um, to be able to go through and, and do something sort of deeper. Um, I, don't, I don't have a ton of advice on that. Um, a lot of the time I use AB, making sure that I'm not um, hitting the varnish cache. Um, and then in terms of monitoring... That, that's in terms of profiling the dev environment. In terms of monitoring, it's sort of on the regular setup. We don't do load monitoring on dev. Um, but we'll just slam it and see how it holds up before and after we're making changes. Again, good enough. Like We usually do that where we, where we know we might have a performance implication. If we're changing CSS, we don't go reprofile. Right? It's just not likely to be the problem. Um, so it's, it's a matter of walking the line and, and trying to you can't always predict what the implication of something's going to be, but a lot of the time you can kind of have a good sense for it and, and you check when you're worried. Yeah, stress the environment when we need to. Again, A, B is the simplest way to just throw a ton of requests with whatever tunable concurrency you have <clears throat> and measure how fast you can serve pages back up. Again, infrastructure as code allows you to have your dev environment be very close to your production environment. If you're running cloud servers, you know, you can never totally isolate things from the noisy neighbor or whatever might impact the specific production instance, but you can get a really darn good idea. I'll spin up another eight gigabyte rack space instance with the exact same other credentials, or exact same other specs, I mean. Um, slam it and see what it can do, and that's, that's usually pretty darn close. Um, and we do a lot of that, by the way, spinning up a new environment that has the actual production specs and testing a major release. Um, because right, if you're running dev on a two gigabyte instance and your MySQL server alone has an eight gigabyte instance in production, you're not gonna get a good sense of the real topology. And having all that stuff in Puppet makes it easy to be like, let me spin up 10 servers, I'll just pay, them for, pay for them for the next five hours while I do my tests and then tear them back down. Um, so sharing, one of the things, sharing responsibility. Um, at ZivTech, everybody's on call. Um, every once in a while it comes up, why don't we hire an ops person that can be the person that has to be on call? And I'm always like, no, because I don't want that guy having to deal with everybody else's mistakes in the middle of the night. Everybody, 
everybody's on call, um, and that has totally been transformative for how confident developers are <laughs> um, and how much testing they want to do before they roll stuff out. Um, we, we host a lot of meetups, and we push other people to as well. That's another great way to level up your skill. You guys are all at DrupalCon, so I'm probably preaching to the choir about uh, getting out there. Um, I thought I fixed that slide. Lunch and leers. Um, it's a lawsuit waiting to happen. Lunch and learns, however, um, are really helpful. So what we do, um, what we do, I must have loaded an old copy of my slides. I'm so sorry, guys. I fixed both of those typos. Um, so lunch and learns uh, are um, where we have someone from the team, and again, we have junior developers and senior developers, more often senior, um, present. And attendance is optional, but the company buys lunch, so pretty much everybody stays to get free lunch. Um, and it, I think it absolutely pays for itself in how much we level up the team, how much people learn, and it's a huge employee perk because most of us are in this industry because we like learning new things. And so pushing other people to present, to practice getting up and talking in front of a group, to show whatever it is they're working on in their free time, whether they're, sometimes we'll you know, do things that are way off topic, present on you know, what you're doing with Bitcoin. None of our projects touch Bitcoin, but it's cool to learn about. Um, or more often, um, you know, show, show the monitoring stuff that we're rolling out, the, the, new, the new module that we discovered that we think everybody should be using. Um, communication. Again, uh, making sure that everyone's as redundant as possible, that if you don't come into work tomorrow, things don't grind to a halt. Um, I know I'm, I think I'm just over time here, so I'll, uh, I'm, this is sort of my last slide. Um, email and chat. Uh, I highly recommend everybody use something like HipChat, Slack, IRC, something. Um, I also highly recommend having a Hue bot in there um, that can tie into your other, that's a chat bot. It's GitHub Node.js project. Makes it really easy to be able to um, add on nice features and get, um, again, this isn't just from Hue bot, but get uh, an agent from your monitoring and from your testing in there. There are Jenkins plugins for, for IRC and, and, Hue, and HipChat. Um, so that when your tests pass or fail, that pops up in the room for the project so that everybody knows the current status of the builds, of the deployments. Um, every time anybody clicks the button in Jenkins to roll a new tag and deploy it to production, um, that pops up in that chat log, which gives you this really nice history when you want to go back and sort of see what happened because people are discussing the projects and you're seeing the automated steps um, pop up with notifications in the chat window so that you know, you know, at it's really nice for ports from postmortems. At 5.05, we deployed a tag. At 5.10, we were in there screaming about how the client was on the phone and furious. <laughs> At 5.15, it was resolved. <laughs> um, and so the uh, automated feedback, that's the key of getting those um, into that email and chat so that you kind of have that event log of what's happened and so that the whole team knows and is, and is involved. The other thing with sharing is giving everybody logins to any of the automated processes. Every member of the team should be able to get in and see the Puppet dashboard, see the, um, see the, um, the Sensu notifications. Um, we have a single sign-on proxy that sort of sits in front of all that stuff so that you can do one single sign-on and get to all of the different services that we're using to do monitoring. So in review, um, you don't need to roll all this stuff out at once, right? Anything is good. Anything is better than nothing, um, and you need to keep in mind kind of what's good enough. Um, you know, we started small and just kept adding a little bit, piece over piece, week over week, trying to level up our game, and, and pretty soon um, we had a pretty complete suite that was really making our lives a lot better. Um, if you don't have the right tools and the right methods, um, you know, you can you can kind of get by. Um, you can sort of work around it. You know, you don't you don't necessarily need the keys. Uh, to be able to accomplish your job. Um, there's sometimes ways that you can kind of get around it, uh, not do things the right way. But um, right, you're never really going to reach nirvana. This is never going to get you riding through the sky on a unicorn. Right? That, for that, you need to level up your team, level up your game, um, and start rolling these pieces out. Um, most of the gifts came from devopsreactions.tumblr.com. I highly, highly, highly recommend that you uh, follow that account. Uh, it's really good. Um, the end. Thanks, guys.